in a small town in western Germany, not far from the border of Holland and Belgium. Uh, until I was 10 years old, I went to the local elementary school in, in Drove, and then I went to the gymnasium, which is basically, basically the equivalent of a private school here, uh, hoping to someday become a veterinarian. And uh, things were okay until 1933. I had friends everywhere. Uh, they stayed at my house, I stayed at their houses until Hitler came into power, then all of a sudden things changed. And kids were told not to associate with Jewish students anymore, and eventually we became isolated. And uh, then in 1935, uh, the edict came, no Jews in schools of higher learning anymore. And uh, I was told at the end of school year, that's the end of your education and you're out. Then, of course, it became a question of, well, what do you do when you get out? Uh, in those days, edicts became worse and worse, and, and uh, emigration became basically uh, a, a topic uh, uh, around the dinner table. I went home and I was lucky enough that my grandfather, who had been in business for quite a few years in, in a heating and plumbing business, he had a lot of friends in the neighborhood. He found a job for me with a Christian family, a man who had an automobile repair shop. And I worked there uh, for, for quite a while until the morning of the 10th of November, 38. I get a frantic phone call from my sister, Ernest, go home immediately. All the synagogues are burning and uh, uh, get home to the parents. I get on my bike about 15 miles away from home, past the burned out synagogue, past some Jewish home that had been vandalized and come to my home. Luckily, it had not been damaged in any way. They simply passed us by. I'm not there for a half hour, and our local policeman shows up. We had a one one man police force in town. The town had a population of about 800, and the policeman says, "Look, I've got orders to arrest uh, to arrest every Jewish male between the ages of 16 and 65, quote unquote, for their own protection from the enraged German populace." Reason being, a young Polish Jew had killed a German consular official in Paris when he asked about the whereabouts his, of his parents, who had been basically arrested by the Germans and taken to the Polish border and simply dumped across the border. That was the uh, reason that Goebbels, who was Germany's propaganda minister, used, of course, to incite the population. International Jewry is, uh, up, uh, is rising up against us and we got to do something about it. The result was arresting probably 30 or 40,000 Jewish males between the ages of 16 and 65 and shipping them off to the various concentration camps. I mean, there was Dachau and there was Sachsenhausen and, and uh, Buchenwald. They were the three that they were sent to. And we were marched off to the railroad station. There was a train that was waiting for us, basically, and, and it took off. We had no idea where we were headed. Uh, and on the way, the train stopped at a number of other stations, picking up more men. Eventually, I don't know after how many hours, we ended up at Weimar. And then, of course, we knew what was, was up. Weimar is right next to the Buchenwald concentration camp. We were chased off the, off the train. A bus took us to the camp, and there we were lined up, roll call, and then the heads were shaved, and then we marched off to barracks that... Uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of people have seen what they look like in, in the various camps, open on one end and, and uh, uh, basically inside was uh, arranged like shelving, everything layers about two or three feet, three feet uh, one above the other. And uh, that was our home uh, as long as we were going to be in camp. And uh, basically once in camp we were kept separate from the regular camp customers that had been there for a long time. Those were the political 
prisoners that they'd had there for quite some time, communists, socialists, uh, Catholic priests, uh, homosexuals, gypsies, you name it, Jewish people, and, and also regular common criminals. And they all wore a striped prison garb. We were just herded into an area surrounded by a chain link fence and, and barbed wire around it. And we were not made to work, we were not doing anything, we were just, just there and milled around every day. There was a roll call every morning. We were fed once a day, uh, and the way that worked is we were lined up in columns. The first group of people were given a, a, a mess kit or, or a, a bowl and a spoon, and prisoners from the other camp had come in uh, with food, and each of us got a label full of what I used to call unidentifiable slop, and ate it standing in line and then handing the mess kits and, and uh, the, the, the bowl and spoon unwashed to the next guy behind us and that went on until the whole group was fed. Yeah, well, Conditions of course were horrible, this was the middle of November by then and all we were wearing was the clothes that uh, on our backs that we had come with and uh, we sort of, sort of hung close together to stay warm but there were also a lot of people older than 65 that the Nazis had arrested in other parts of uh, Germany. And some of these people simply couldn't stand the rigors of it and, and a lot of them died. And we just had to stand there and watch them die. There's nothing we could do about it. On the other hand, uh, we were lucky enough that we weren't on the other side of the fence because there in the mornings we saw prisoners lined up for roll call and then marched off or driven off the work details. That was okay. In the evening we saw them come back and then they were lined up again for roll call again and then they had to stand there and watch punishment being meted out. That is where the SS guys outdid themselves or each other with how much punishment they could basically inflict on people. We saw them flog people until they were unconscious, time to a pole and flog them. We saw them hang people. Well, we've seen people hang before. We saw, saw them tie a man's hands, hands his, behind his back, then hang them on uh, what I thought was meat hooks, or like, like meat hooks, on the wall until, of course, uh, they fainted and, and, and fell, and, and then they cut them down. And, uh, if you think that was bad, the worst thing we saw was when they took a prisoner, stuck him into a barrel that was spiked with nails, and rolled him down the hill. And then, of course, bleeding as he was, let dogs finish him off. I mean, that's man's inhumanity in action. And the SS guards uh, enjoyed doing what they were doing. Of course, by that time, uh, people in Germany really didn't know what was going on in the camps and whenever somebody was killed like this the family always got what was supposed to be his ashes and always with an explanation well he was shot while trying to escape that was uh, the explanation they got. We had absolutely no idea what what was to happen to us our families at home had been told that uh, anybody who could prove that he would leave Germany reasonably soon would have a place to go to, uh, could be released from concentration camp if they could prove that they would leave Germany before too long. Well, my parents had absolutely no idea what to do. After all, we grew up in Germany. We knew nothing but German, the German language. We had no relatives outside of the country to speak of. And my parents contacted a friend of mine whom I had met in Essen when I was, was there uh, as an apprentice. They knew his address and they told him, look, Ernest is in concentration camp and he needs somebody to sponsor to get out of concentration camp. Is there anything that you can do to get him out? Well, my friend John spoke to the people he was rooming with and told them, look, I've got a friend sitting in concentration camp, he needs a sponsor, he needs an affidavit of support. Uh, what can I do to help him? 
they told them, we'll do it. Not knowing me, they didn't know me from Adam, didn't know anything about me at all. They sent the necessary papers sponsoring me to the American consulate at Stuttgart, which is what it took. And uh, with that information, which of course he passed on to my parents, my father went to the Gestapo and said, look here, this is what's going on. And uh, they issued uh, my release from concentration camp. This is how I got out after close to four weeks. Of course, the proviso was that uh, I'd have to leave Germany uh, in a reasonably short time. Well, I got called to the American consulate in April, so that was three months later, almost four, almost four months later. And after a thorough physical and mental exam, uh, I got my visa. I go home, go to the local mayor's office, uh, the, the uh, yeah, mayor's office, and get my passport. You know, something new in the passport. You know, before passports used to be typical German passports. Now there was a big J in the front, on the front cover of, of the passport. And there was another thing, all of a sudden my name, instead of Ernst Kaufmann, became Ernst Israel Kaufmann. In other words, every Jewish male from that time on had to sign their names with the middle initial of Israel. The women's middle name became Sarah. So any document, any paper you signed had to be with this. That was my passport. When I left uh, at the railroad station in Cologne, my mother was too distraught to go to the station with us. And a cousin of mine came with my father to see me off at the railroad station. And uh, I'll never forget my father's last words to me were, don't do anything I'd have to be ashamed of. Now here I was an 18-year-old kid and, and this is uh, tears in his eyes. Uh, of course, uh, there was always the hope that somehow, sometime we would see each other again, but of course, times proved differently. And at the pier in New York, uh, I was received by John, my, my friend, and Anne and Joe, who were my sponsors. Well, they themselves had no place for me. They had no, no place and no real plans for me at that particular point. They found a place for me with a friend of theirs, the, the Lehman House friend, a Dr. Esselstein, who had a, pra a practice, I think, in, in Brooklyn or wherever, but who also owned a gentleman farm in Claverock near Hudson on Hudson. So I went up there for the summer, and that's basically where I learned to speak English because nobody spoke a word of German, and, and I had to do what, what every Im immigrant does. And basically what I did is memorize 25 words every night with the dictionary and, and try to keep it. And from there I went to Philadelphia where my sister had finally settled and my brother-in-law. I joined a German Jewish club which had come in existence that also had a soccer team. And uh, it so happened that I didn't only play soccer, but I also met the manager's youngest sister who eventually became my wife. At that time, I had, like everybody else, since I had gotten my green card right after I arrived in this country, I was registered for the draft. And, and he said, why don't you try to get any uh, deferment from the draft? I hoped, of course, to get one because, again, I was trying to save as much money as I could f to get my parents out, who by that time couldn't pay for passage to this country anymore had they been able to come. Would have to be paid for with foreign currency. Pearl Harbor came, December 7th, 41. And uh, in fact, the night of December 6th to 7th, I was sitting in my then girlfriend's kitchen with her talking about planning a future. I got home about four o'clock in the morning, heard the news of Pearl Harbor, get on the phone to my girlfriend and say, things have changed. I'm going to enlist because uh, uh, I've got a reason to go and fight. Uh, I got orders to go to the Pacific and I went to headquarters and, and, and talked to the personnel officer and said, look, I speak German, I have a working knowledge of French. What can I do in the Pacific? In Europe, I can be of use because 
I didn't have to tell him I, I hated the Germans. And uh, he listened and, and he, he changed my orders and I went to Camp Ritchie in Maryland, which was an intelligence training center where people were trained in, in uh, uh, psychological warfare, order of uh, battle and, and weapons training and, and uh, interrogation, interp photo interpretation, all the things that basically f fall into the intelligence uh, sector of, of work. I was shipped over to England uh, and became a member, in fact second in command, of a prisoner interrogation team. Intelligence service assigned us to the 19th Corps, which was headquartered in, in, in Warminster. We landed on D plus five and shortly thereafter I was with the 113th Cavalry and, and interrogating prisoners that we captured. Uh, I was with the front units all along and uh, at one point we were near the vicinity of a, a big wooded area in France. The word was the woods are heavily defended by the Germans. They got a lot of traps in there and whatnot. Uh, we got to be careful. So I suggested to Colonel Biddle, who was the cavalry commander, why don't we try a hawk calling deal? Well, he agreed and I went with my jeep sandwiched between two, ta two light tanks, moving slowly towards the woods. And there I just, uh, with an improvised loudspeaker, foghorn or whatever it was, I hollered into the woods that, uh, look, what, why are you Germans still fighting the war? You know, you've lost the war anyhow, and we're making steady progress. You're better off being American prisoners. Not only that, we treat you well. You even get American cigarettes and whatnot. And, uh, why don't you just give up? Because uh, why fight for losing cause? I mean, words to that effect, not, not exactly the same thing. And uh, not a shot was fired at us. And we pulled back and the next morning we went through the woods, collected about a hundred prisoners without firing a shot. And uh, we moved on. Aachen is the first German city that the first division captured. And that was the first, basically, major city we got across the Siegfried Line. It was a big achievement, but uh, then, of course, uh, from there, the next object objective was the Rhine River. Years ago, when I was growing up uh, in, in, in Germany, yet in the 1930s, I had watched the Germans build a dam on a river called Ruhr. Now, uh, I had no idea what they we're building it for in such haste. And I figured, well, while we're there, Aachen was in our hands. Why not go and investigate? Well, with my men, I go to Aachen. We went, found the Water District Administration office and found a safe that we blew open. You know, hand grenades do a pretty good job sometimes. I find in there a treasure trove of German military documents which describe, first of all, how both dams, the old existing one and the new one, were built, what their capacity was, and above all, what would happen if the dams were blown. How much, how many billions of water would cascade downriver, how long an area would be inundated, uh, how large an area would be impassable, and, and all this stuff that proved to be so important that when I came back to the G2, Colonel Platt sent me immediately to the army engineer and said, tell him what you found. And uh, I get to the army engineer, tell him what, what I found and what not. And he, of course, I said, I'll transfer, uh, translate it as quickly as I can. It caused attack orders to 12th Army Group, which in my opinion was probably a quarter of a million men, if not more, was halted immediately because they were supposed to go early in November. Uh, to attack across the Rhine, was halted immediately, and uh, basically shortly after that came, of course, the Battle of the Bulge and whatnot, and eventually the Germans blew those dams to cover their own retreat, rather than to keep us from advancing. Mm -hmm. uh, and once once uh, the, the flooding had subsided, of course, we, we were able to get across the Ruhr River. So it 
it may have saved a catastrophe. The first division had taken Aachen and then a regiment was heading towards Dover, my hometown. I figured, okay, I'll see what I can do if I can maybe get attached to them and see what happened to my folks. Well, of course, I had no trouble getting myself attached to the 1st Division Regiment. We get into my hometown, which was completely evacuated because of the heavy fighting that had been taken care of in the area. There wasn't a soul I could see. I got into my parental home. Didn't look any more the way I remembered it. And the funny thing is, is I come up to the attic in there, and there is about six or seven cubicles made with raw wooden boards. I had no idea what they were, had no idea why they were there and what not, and I didn't find out until after the war what had happened. In May of 1941, the Germans had moved all the Jews of my hometown, 26 people, evicted them out of their homes, from their homes, moved them into my parental home, and kept them there until they were deported in March of 1942, in almost nine months, they kept the 26 people, some of them kids under 10 years of age, many people older than 80 years old. One house, one toilet. You can just imagine the misery these people live with. And the funny thing is, is what kept these people going more than anything else, other than the meager rations that the Nazis allowed them, was that Christian neighbors at night went and smuggled food to them uh, uh, to give them some more than, than they had. And uh, I heard it said after the war that the reasons the Germans claimed they moved these people together was so that when they were ready to deport them, they didn't have to go and hunt them up. In, in March of, of 42, they were all shipped off to a camp called Belges in eastern Poland, near the Ukrainian border, where within a span of nine months the Germans killed 500,000 people, men, women and children. That was a death camp. You know, there is a distinction between death camp and, and, and concentration camp. The concentration camps are the, the places where the Germans basically uh, work people to death. Uh, they didn't kill them outright. That's the places where they give people tattoo numbers on their arms and whatnot to identify them. And they were all inside of Germany. There was not a single quote-unquote death camp in Germany. I mean, the Germans weren't, uh, weren't stupid. All the death camps, you know, Auschwitz and Medanek and uh, Belges and, and uh, Treblinka and you name them, they were all in Poland. A couple of civilians came across our lines and they said, you know, we come from a town of Einbeck that normally has a population of about 12,000. And that population has swelled up to about 32,000 from, uh, with refugees from the east. And we got a military hospital here. And we also got a military headquarters here. We got a general who wants to put up fight in, the, win up a fight in the worst way. Not, is there anything the Americans can do to help us? Well, like a stupid idiot, Next morning, I go into town with my driver who volunteered to go with me, a white rag on my um, jeep in the middle of town, we could stop. And I said, look, I got orders to see the commanding general. Well, the guy said, stop me, get into the back of the jeep and directed me to go to headquarters. And once we come close to headquarters, those two get out and start marching me towards, towards the building. I turned to my driver and said, get the hell back there, see if you can make it, and tell him what I'm up to. Stand in front of the general there, I tell him my name is so-and-so, and I'm from uh, uh, the American commanding officer opposing you. I have orders to tell you, or to ask for the immediate surrender of the town of Einbeck, and that we are prepared to attack, and I'm supposed to uh, wait for an answer. And... Uh, uh, you'll be held responsible for any loss of life and, and, and property in the town if you decide to defend the city. The general tells me to wait outside. Fifteen minutes later, the general calls me into his office. Well, I've decided to 
accompany you to your commanding officer and to surrender the city. Twenty years later, I get a telegram from the town of Einbeck, this man still being the mayor of the town, thanking me once more for having the, saved the city and its population from disaster. <laughs> so uh, that was the story of the city of Einbeck. Well, of course, the cavalry moved on. We come into a place called Wernigerode. That was by that the 11th of April. And this was the 8th of April was Einbeck. The 11th of April, we, we take the town of Wernigerode in, in Thuringia. We took it the night before. We were bivouacked there. And the next morning, I'm on my way to City Hall to talk to the mayor about in, in giving, to give the mayor instructions about where civilians were to turn in their firearms and, and, and give them some instructions of, of what we expected the population to do. And on the way there, right in the middle of the walk towards the City Hall, we were ambushed by two SS men who obviously had either hidden in town the night before, uh, during the night or snuck be, uh, uh, sneaked back in uh, in the morning. We were taken in crossfire and, and uh, the intelligence officer of the 113th who was with me and two MPs uh, returned fire. I returned fire too. I thought I did. I thought I hit one of the guys. But the MPs didn't get hurt, but Captain Hutton, the intelligence officer of the cavalry, and I were both wounded. And I only remember being dragged into a doorway someplace near there, and I heard a woman say, oh, that is terrible. That I still remember in German. I was out. That was it. That was the end of the war for me. I was shot in, in, in my back. Uh, uh, I had a collapsed lung and some shattered ribs and, uh, and a completely shattered left arm. I woke up a week later in the VAC hospital and uh, with a purple heart pinned to my bed sheet. And I, I just want so, to say, Ernest, you are the epitome of what has made our nation great. Uh, you came to this country as an immigrant. You've escaped from an evil dictator. You served in the military to protect your new country. A dedicated combat soldier, you were able to save both American and German lives as the war raced to a conclusion. Wounded in battle, you were recognized for your bravery by earning the Bronze Star. Ernest, you're five foot three, but you're a giant of a man. Yep, the Armed Forces Heritage Museum salutes you.